Good morning. Good to be back again. It's good to see you. Let's have the children go out for uh, the uh, We Church, Junior Church, Kingdom Kids, and all the other uh, names. You got, you got the idea. I just appreciate the music so much, but uh, you might be sitting there as a visitor or even as an attender, and you go, boy, I didn't know that song. Well, that's true for everybody. That's true for me. That first one, uh, Every Day, is that what the name of it was? Every Day? And uh, because this is me, every day. Na, 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 na. <laughs> you ever do that? Kind of like, you know, you're just praising the Lord. And I guess it doesn't really matter that you knew the words or didn't, as long as you're praising the Lord. And that don't mean that I'm soaking it up and enjoying it, because we do. It means what am I giving him when I sing, okay? Now, in our sermon series for the month of January, we've been going by the grow outward, grow deeper, and grow together. Grow outward is evangelism. Grow deeper is discipleship. And uh, grow next generation. Grow together. And th this message today is the grow together next generation. All right, so uh, the first slide there is about AI. You know, this is coming. And maybe you have looked at uh, online about it. But listen. Whether you wanted the internet to come or not, it came, didn't it? Yeah. And AI, whether we're supposed to like that or not, I, 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 artificial intelligence, wow, somebody had to put that information in there. And, and it might be a government, huh? It might be a government that we don't like where this is headed. Guess what? You're not going to be able to do anything about it, and I can't do anything about it. What is the next generation going to have to face? I don't know. Maybe the next generation is for it. And, and the reason you don't want AI is because you're an old fogey. Huh? I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But I, it has the potential to, to be harmful. It has the potential to be bad. So I'm telling you that the next generation, whoever they may be, we might not understand the next generation. Is that possible? Yeah, that's possible. Um, next generation can mean many things. And, and one of the things it can mean, I'm not talking about our young people, okay? I'm talking about movements that come and go, movements that come in. And I'm talking about it can be trouble. Now, there was a story on Facebook this past week, for those of you that may have seen it. Um, the man wrote, our six-year-old handed us a note his teacher had called my wife and I and, and called us in for an emergency meeting. We asked our son if he had any idea why we were going in to see the teacher, and he said she didn't like my drawing. We went in the next day. His teacher pulled the drawing out and said, I asked him to draw his family, and he drew this. And she wants to know, can you explain that? What in the world is going on? Well, the husband and wife looked at each other, and the wife said, well, no, not at all. I don't mind explaining. We're, it's our family vacation, and we were snorkeling off the Bahamas. <laughs> and so misconceptions about the next generation preconceived ideas, misunderstandings, but you, I'm talking to a group of people here today that half of you used to use terminology back in the 70s called the generation gap. Well, we don't use generation gap anymore. Nobody talks like that, or do we? But we don't call it that anyway, anymore, but our society has been hit by our society has been bombarded by so many ideas that when we teach a generation that there are no absolute truths, and the church does not teach that, the church believes in absolute truth, the Word of God. But it has been taught for a decade after decade that there is no absolute truth. And so, therefore, whatever you believe, whatever you think, that is absolute truth for you and that we're supposed to accept whatever comes down the, the river. And that's not true. Life gets confusing. It gets frustrating. Life is broken. And the church 
has an obligation to teach the good news of Jesus Christ. And since we have that obligation, the good news, we're going to teach it to the next generation. We'll teach it to any generation. We will teach it to all generations. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Question is, does Jesus want the next generation to know about him? Absolutely he does. So this is not Creighton's church. This is not Jacob Harris's church. This is not the elder's church. And shocker, this isn't your church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is the Lord's church. And, and we might not like, some people might not like the next generation. A lot of times we don't like the a next of anything. It's because we don't understand it. And maybe we should spend time getting to know whatever generation it is we don't understand and try to figure out how we can love each other. But if you don't like the next generation, tough luck, they're here. And I'm glad. And Jesus is glad. Colossians 1.13, let me read that tiny verse for you. Um, Colossians 1.13, I, I happen to love this text. Because I believe that the kingdom is the church. And you down the church, you're down in the kingdom of God. You're, you're down in the church that Jesus started back 2,000 years ago. And in Colossians 1.13 says, For he, Jesus, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. The kingdom of his beloved son. And let me tell you something. Every generation is invited to be part of the kingdom. Every people group of the earth is invited to be part of the kingdom. Jesus settled this a long time ago. Uh, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You know what this is. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's our role here. Let's pretend and act like right now there are not other congregations on the entire earth. We're the only ones. We're the only one. We're the only church on the entire face of the earth. What are we going to do with that? For us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I take great comfort that Jesus is with us. But we got our work cut out for us because it says, and teach them whatever I've commanded you to do. What did he command us to do? Go into all the world, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that will be to every generation, all generations, and next generation. Now with Gary Johnson and Mike Killebrew uh, last September and our uh, team, uh, about 15 of us, 15, 16 of us. He asks six questions. What are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? What's missing? What's confusing? What should we expect in the next three years if we practice this? And what is the win for, for living like this? What, what is so important? And, and he asked those six questions. And, and we church members, 15, 16 of us, began to uh, rapid fire and come up with uh, about nine on poster sheets like those and, and just answering these questions. What's wrong? What's right? And we did that and came up with about nine on each page, on each question. And, uh, and so um, I'm going to present some of the things that we said. I cannot take time to present everything that we wrote down, but we voted, see, we went up with a marker, went up to the board, and we put a little mark there with the one that we agreed with the most out of the nine. So what are we doing right? Well, we provide a nursery for anybody who wants to come in the auditorium and, and their children be taken care of. We have a, a Kingdom Kids, a junior church. We have a focus. It's a teenage youth meeting. Uh, we have young adult, young adult Bible studies and fellowship. Uh, the next generation in our church are serving Christ. That's a win. That's a plus. The next generation in this congregation is serving Jesus and that we make it our goal to be biblically 
sound. So, uh, number two is, what are we doing wrong? Well, every church in America just about, how do I know? I've not surveyed them. I just know that the, the trends that we are experiencing turnover. Turnover. Talk to any minister. Talk to memberships at any congregation, and there's turnover. And, and not, <clears throat> not all of our people in the church has invited a friend. Not all the young people have invited friends. And many times uh, we're guilty that our church is a Sunday morning church. We, we don't. Now, we do now because we're working on it, but we, there were times where we didn't have any activities other than Sunday morning. Sunday morning was it. And so uh, we have not been big proponents of relational discipleship. But now we're putting an emphasis upon that, and, and we shall because it's the will of the Lord. And number three is what's missing? What's missing? Now, remember, I'm not mentioning everything. I'm just mentioning some for the message this morning. But uh, what's missing are more young adults. What's missing are more volunteers. What's missing are more young families. The next generation, we love the next generation. We want the next generation here. And by the way, I have talked to uh, mega church ministers, and more than ever, they are now feeling the crunch of fewer volunteers. And you say, well, that can't be. The church is running blah, 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 thousands. And they got all these volunteers. Yes, they do. But people don't want to volunteer. People are not serving Jesus the way they used to serve Jesus. Um, and so everybody's feeling the crunch. Number four, what's uh, confusing? Well, uh, it, what was voted on was uh, how to talk to unchurched friends or uh, getting correct priorities in our lives so we can be a strong church family. And uh, understanding biblically, here, here were two things mentioned. What's confusing? Understanding biblically human sexuality and transgenderism. Biblically. Then number five, what needs to happen within the next three years? We need more solid teachers. They don't just poof. It's not a magic show. They just don't appear. They have to be trained. And then we need uh, more numbers of young people and young families and relational disciples in the church family. Number six, uh, what's important now for a win? Well, I love our vision, mission, and values. And number one on our values it is rooted in biblical authority. We need an increased social presence, we said. And last, our people must invest themselves. Our people must invest themselves in time for the kingdom. They must invest themselves in their talent, using their talent for Jesus and their money. And again, more was said about that in the meeting, but let's move on. The Word of God has the answer. Paul is traveling uh, from Judea. He's traveling through uh, Eastern Europe, sharing the gospel. And we come to, and if you would turn, please, to Acts chapter 17, and uh, we find the answer in his uh, preaching for the next generation. Here's what we're going to look for. In, in verse 1, Paul was out of his religious surroundings. Verse 1, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. He was out of his surroundings. He was out of Judea where it was cool to be uh, a servant of Jehovah God. Now he's up in Europe where there are many false gods and, and whole cities are dedicated to these uh, false gods. And then we find in verses 2 through 4 that Paul kept his fellowship going. He did. He kept his fellowship and his custom of teaching truth even when he was away from home. When, when you are away from home, do you worship God? When you were away from home, do you still tag in with Christians? And, and if there isn't a church there that's going to serve the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, do you meet with your family and worship when you're away? Paul is away, and he is fellowshipping uh, with people, and he is still teaching truth. Let's read 2 through 4. According to Paul's custom, oh, don't you love that word? 
According to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, verse 4, and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and the number of the leading women. But people don't always receive the message. And that is not, that's not our problem. That's their problem. But the people have held back and they don't go and share because, well, they might not receive the message. I'm, I guarantee you, you're not going to be able to get everybody to receive the message. And so let's read verses 5 through 9 that people don't always receive the message about Jesus, 5 through 9. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking uh, along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. See, people had heard of the, what they called a sect of Christianity. They had heard of it. They've come here, and they're turning the whole world upside down for this, for this Jesus. In verse 7, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. How is that? Because Caesar is Lord, and everyone bows to Caesar. But Christians won't. Christians say that Jesus is Lord, and they will not bow to the government. And so they're going to bow to Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge or a bond from Jason and the others, they released them. There's persecution. There's consequences when we serve Jesus. When, when you come to Christ, oh, I'm just joining us at a neat, I'm just joining us such a neat church family. I just love the people, the music. Listen, you can come to Christ and lose your life the next week. You can lose your life because you are coming uh, into a kingdom that does not believe like the world. And we will pay for it. We'll pay for it in some respect. But where is Paul, verses 10 and 11? The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away uh, by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. We read that in the first at Thessalonica. And now he's at Berea. He's at the synagogue again. So what in the world is a synagogue? Well, you can see on the screen that the synagogue is a, a Jewish house of worship, sometimes called a shul. It's what a church building is to Christians. So a synagogue, it is when they could not get to temple, and synagogues began to show up and surface uh, around when the uh, Israelites were carried off in captivity to Babylon. They created synagogues where they could worship. And so through the dispersa, where Jews went all over the land, they created synagogues everywhere because they could not get back to Jerusalem, to the temple. And so the word in the Greek is together and bring. To bring together is the synagogue. It's a building that they used in Judaism. So what is it for the church? Ah, I don't go to church. Do you know what you just said? You thought you meant I don't go to the building at 401 East 3rd Street. That's what you meant when you said I don't go to church. What you're really saying is I do not go where God calls his people. What about that? I don't think it's important to obey God's voice. Because the church is the Greek word ekklesia, and it means called out to assemble. An illustration in Greek literature was the fire department was ecclesia. The fire department was churched. What's that? They were called out. And we've been called out to worship the Lord God Almighty. 
And the word here is, is used to refer to worship him, to gather with like precious faith and be part of one another. So where is Paul in this text? He's in the synagogue. Why? Because he was raised, listen, he was raised up in Judaism and he knows how the Jews think. So he goes to the synagogue, even though he's a Christian. Well, he's also Jew, but he's also Greek. And so he's up in Europe going to Jewish synagogues, and he's teaching them about the Christ. Some people say, uh, and they growl, grimace. I don't, I don't have to go to church. And what they're saying is, I don't have to assemble with those who have been called out by God. But Paul assembled even when he was away from home. So, uh, verse 11. Verse 11. Now, these, and he's in Berea now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Don't you love that? Thessalonica, not so much. They, they caused a riot in the city against Christians. But these people at Berea, they're more noble-minded than those at Thessalonica. They received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's interesting. The Bereans love the word of God. May this congregation love the word of God. Now, Paul moves through Athens. I want to read 16 through 21. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. You know, I think we can describe ourselves, that our own spirit, our own soul, our own thinking is being provoked when we see what's going on in America. In verse 17, so he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were Conversing with him, some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him out to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears so we want to know what these things mean. Now, verse 21 is important. Verse 21 describes what you and I go through in our culture, what we go through in our neighborhood, what we go through in our America. Verse 21 says, Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And people are flocking because they have no light, they have no direction, they have no godly guidance, they flock to anything, and they welcome it. And they put down anyone who would be looked at as old school. And so, we find out some beautiful things here. Look at how Paul went through opposition, and when you go through opposition, I just... I just, I just get the feeling that we in America, if we go through opposition, we'll go throw ourselves across the bed and cry. And when they went through opposition, the Bible says they praised God, that they were counted worthy to be persecuted for Jesus. Wow, I wish I, wish I could get that in my head. I wish we could get that in our head. Last, when Paul goes to Mars Hill, he is going before a broken culture that worship and serve false gods. Let's read 22 through, 20, through, 22 through 33. 22 through almost the end of the chapter. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I will proclaim to you. Isn't that cool? 
24. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Verse 26. And he made from, listen to this, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. 27. That they would seek God if perhaps they uh, might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. 28. For in him we live and move and exist. And even some of your own poets, get that now, even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. 29. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver, or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere, see, all generations, every generation, next generation, all people everywhere, verse 30, should repent. 31. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out from their midst. When is it time to cut bait, and when is it time to fish? Well, we fish when we can. We share the good news when we can. Well, there's times when we have to back out. It's time to cut bait. Situations sometimes will prohibit or stop us from sharing Christ. That's okay. That's okay. It's time to cut bait. And then there's the time... To fish. Jesus said, stomp the dust off your feet and go to the next place. Well, that's not exactly how he worded it. What he said in, in Matthew 10, 14 through 16, is to shake the dust off your feet and go to the next place that will receive the message. And so it's time to stop fishing. It's time to cut bait and go to the next place to fish. So, to win the next generation, we need to understand their culture. Getting back to verse uh, 23. For while I was passing through and examining objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I will proclaim to you. And then in verse 26, verse 26 is so important. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Listen, we've got to get a hold of this. He made Adam... And Eve in the garden. God made every nation from Adam. We need to grab hold of that because there are not many races. This is not politics. This is the Bible. There's one race. And that one race is humankind. And, and, and you can turn on the news every single night and here's something about races, races, races. And I, and I, was, I was talking to some African Americans, and they said, I, I wish they would stop doing that because we like it here. We enjoy living here, and we have a good life. But when they put that stuff on TV that we're all at odds with one another, it creates dissension and hate. Think, think about it. God made one race, the human race. So 26 says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. And so to reach the next generation with the Bible, we must teach them the Bible and help them to understand that it's not many races and it's not that you're for the black race or you're for the uh, white race or you're for the, uh, the Asian race. Stop doing that. We are all one people. And we're all trying to come to Jesus Christ. And if they're not, we want to share 
the good news with them. To reach the next generation, we must understand where they are coming from and learn their culture. In verse 28 of our text, for in him we live and move and exist, and even some of your own poets. It's important to recognize that not only did Paul know and understand their culture, he used it in his messages. He quoted their poets. I, I, I know of preachers that I, I love and respect, but they will only use the Bible and they will not use any illustrations from our culture. Paul did. I like Paul's example. Paul knows and understands them. And Paul also makes a, a biblical connection, 29 through 32. Uh, he, he adds that, well, okay, verse 29, being the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is gold or silver or stone. We're not gold or silver or stone. And we're children of God. That's his argument. And we're children of God. God has a divine nature. And God has made man in his image. How's that? We have something eternal inside of us, don't we? We have something eternal inside of us. The story of Christ, the good news. I'm going to ask, I'm not closing, but, but, but I am drifting that way, okay? Where is your Thessalonica? Where's your Thessalonians? where people reject you. Identify them and pray for them. Where is your Berea? Where, where are people that love you? Identify them and hang out with them often. Where is your Athens or your Mars Hill? Where in our culture are your friends or family steeped in false gods and strange new teaching? All generations include the next generation. A church, when we, a church fails when a generation of us has not passed on our faith. We've got to pass on our faith. Justin Martyr was born in 8100. Why is that important? It's important because we believe that the last apostle died off about 95 or 98 A.D., so right within five years, the last apostle died. Justin Martyr is being born, which means he's growing up in a church culture that still teaches apostolic teaching. He's still teaching, and here's what he said. He said, we have failed. And he came up with a slogan in AD 130, which means he's 30 years old. And he said, believe, belong, behave. We're failing, and that was, that was his vision, mission, and values. And he shared that with the church. And then he suggested 12 things that must be taught. Are you with me? Are you still with me? Number one, we need to be teaching the people, and he said this back then, 12 things. We need to be teaching the people that God exists. We need to be teaching the people God's word. We need to be teaching uh, the people of the church the story of how sin came into the world. We need to be teaching the people, number four, that Christ became human and that Christ is the atonement for our sin. And number six, the justification by faith. Number seven, the living a transformed life. They weren't living a transformed life, and they, he said we have failed. Number eight, that Jesus uh, rose from the dead physically, the bodily resurrection Number nine, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Number ten, uh, that uh, teach the people about God's kingdom. Number eleven, teach them about the church. And number twelve, teach them about the return of Jesus Christ. I believe that pretty much nails it down. If, if our teenagers leaving youth group and going off to uh, employment out of state or going off to university, wherever they're going, wherever they're headed, do they know those 12 things? And can they explain them to somebody else? I, maybe we've failed. Maybe we've failed. I agree, every next generation that grows up and leaves ought to know those 12 things. So, to teach truth today, ask four questions. 
what do you need to know about this subject? Is this just a sermon that I just happened to pick this Sunday to walk in here? Or am I growing in Christ? H how do you know it's true? You're going to have to study the scriptures. So what? Meaning, what does Creighton want out of me? What is, better yet, what does Jesus want out of me concerning this? What does Jesus want from me? And number four, how does it relate to me? How do I experience? And, and we need to pray this prayer. God, help us to remember and share our God stories. You're praying to God, help me to share my God stories with people. Uh, give us the courage to pass on our faith to the next generation. Thank you for always being there for us. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a simple prayer. What are my God stories? And so I'm going to ask you five questions, and I am closing. Five questions. Number one, what is one story from the Bible that shows God's faithfulness? And whatever that one story is for you, that's the story you'll start sharing. It's a unique story. It's a beautiful story. How is God faithful to us? Share that story often. Let that story become your story. Number two, how have you experienced God's faithfulness in your own life? How has he specifically... You know, God's bailed me out so many times, I don't even remember them all. And you might be there too. You need to grab hold of a couple of them and tell the story often until people say to you, I've already heard that one. I'm glad you said something. I got another one. And you just keep on sharing how God has been faithful in your life. And number three, why is it important to share these stories with others? Because it's important to Jesus that we pass the faith along to others. Number four, who is someone you can share your God story with this week? Number five, how can we encourage each other to share our God stories through fellowship and encouragement? I don't have to go to church. That's true. You don't have to. But to obey the will of the Lord, you do. Because where are you going to get your God stories from? Where are you going to receive your encouragement? from other people that have a faith like yours. You share your story, they share their story, and it's through fellowship and encouragement. When you take that, you, you've heard this illustration so many times, you take that hot burning coal out of the campfire and put it out here by itself, which one's going to die quicker? You know, have you ever noticed that we don't ever stoke this little coal out here? We keep stoking the fire. We keep adding to the campfire, and that's our assembly that God has called us to. We are the church. God bless you. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you today for Jesus Christ. I thank you for the commission to go to all generations, every generation and next generation. I pray, Father, a blessing on these sitting here today and a blessing on those watching through YouTube. I pray, dear God, that we'll accept this teaching, that our congregation will be different in three years and in six years and in 12 years and 24 years and until Jesus comes again. I pray, Father, for people to find hope and peace through Jesus today. In Christ's name, amen.